So the only person who's dragging Lydia Thorpe down is the one who stares back at her in the mirror. This is a woman who still sits in the nation's parliament but's now been banned from a strip club. We looked at security footage, spoke to staff, spoke to security, and uh, it became obvious that uh, the senator's uh, behaviour was not what we considered to be appropriate at the club. Yeah, banned from the strip club, but still has that seat in the Senate with a couple of hundred thousand dollars paid for by you and I every year. Of course, this raises the very pertinent question of what a politician has to do to lose their job or be expelled from Parliament, which is something I took up with law professor George Williams. Well, it's a, it's a very high threshold to actually be kicked out. And, of course, we've got a long list, sadly, of politicians behaving badly. What we do know is under the Constitution, if she commits treason, if she's a citizen of a foreign country, things like that, then she would be kicked out of Parliament. But, of course, this doesn't meet that threshold. Another possibility is that if it was a state parliament, she might actually be expelled. But in this case, the federal parliament's given up its power to expel a member. So the most likely is if she crosses a line, they might suspend her for a period of time. But even that is highly unlikely. It's only happened three times in the history of the federal parliament. And that's why not just in her case, but many other cases, we see federal politicians who retain their seats even where they behave badly. Let's just have a look at one of the incidents that has helped to create Senator Lydia Thorpe's reputation, I suppose. Here she is yelling abuse at police outside an immigration detention centre. This is a lawmaker abusing law enforcers. You are the criminals! You are the only criminals on this land! George, she's not been arrested or charged, but if a politician were charged with an offence that could lead to jailing, a maximum sentence of imprisonment for a year or more, wouldn't that disqualify them? Yes, you're right. But she's also got to be convicted. And as you say, it could be jailable for more than a year. Then that is a ground for disqualification from Parliament. But for that to happen, you've got to move beyond what we're seeing to the police taking action and this going through the courts. Yeah, it's an interesting uh, situation to ponder, really, isn't it? Because when we go back to the uh, gay and lesbian Mardi Gras in Sydney recently, if we have a look at these pictures here, we can see that Senator Lydia Thorpe got on front, uh, in front of the parade. She was obstructing the parade. Police needed to remove her. She was again yelling abuse on this occasion. So she was pulled aside. If she were arrested and charged for an offence, for offences relating to an event like this, are, are there offences that could lead to that uh, prosecution, do have a maximum penalty over a year and could see her qualified, disqualified, no, sorry? No, no, not likely for this type of action. I and mean, we're typically dealing with summary offences. Uh, people might abuse the police, but it would need likely to go further. If there was actually assaulting the police, using physical action and the like, that's the sort of offence that typically gets into that one year or more category. Uh, what you'd call acts of protest, uh, more minor forms of abuse and the like, not likely to cross the threshold. OK, so we can all look forward to uh, Senator Lydia Thorpe's antics for some time to come because it's very unlikely she's going to be expelled from Parliament in any way. We shall see. Let me get your thoughts on the voice debate because you've been mm. active uh, in, this, uh, in this public debate, George. Uh, you've said that uh, the Liberal opposition to the voice is premature. Why? Well, it's premature because I actually think it's disrespectful to the parliamentary process. Uh, the government has announced its wording. We know that members of the Liberal Party have a problem with that. And the right way of dealing with that is to raise it in Parliament. Um, of course, we now have this parliamentary inquiry, which is a good forum for raising those issues. There's the possibility for Liberal members to move amendments on the floor of Parliament to say, we think this needs to be changed because we think it's got a problem. That's how our democracy works. So, so frankly, I was really surprised to see they would come out so early They've actually given up their ability to influence the outcome, maybe even drive it to a better model, if that's what they'd like to do. But also what they've done is given up the possibility of, I think, taking the higher moral ground by, for example, moving an amendment, the government refusing to take that amendment. They can't say they've even tried to get to that point, unfortunately.
Yeah, I think it's a very good point. Uh, another point you've made in your columns is that the Liberal Party has really turned its back on its tradition in this area because it has a proud history. Of course, it was a Liberal government that, that took the 1967 referendum to the people. There was no, no case then. All parties supported it. It's been an observation of mine that if we cast our mind back to 1967 and think that the most important outcome of that referendum was giving the federal government power to make laws for Indigenous people, people, it would have been uncontroversial if we'd said at the time they should actually take advice from Indigenous people before they make those laws. I think that's right. And uh, when we talk about the party that has the, the record of achieving constitutional change for Indigenous peoples, it is the coalition. It's the Liberal and National parties. They did that in 67 with that 90% vote, the most successful in our history. But what we know is it has left unfinished business. Um, that referendum for all its success still hasn't put in place any recognition of our First Peoples in the Constitution. It doesn't provide them the ability to influence the use of that power in, I think, a modest way. And it's why the voice actually has been driven for so many years, actually not by the progressive side of politics, but by some very conservative politicians who have seen it as a really modest addition to our Constitution to give that community a say in a way that's quite cons consistent with the spirit of 67. Professor George Williams, thanks for joining us. Thank you.